Uh, Pastor Jeff uh, got the idea to uh, create that video from one we saw several years ago called Cardboard Testimonies, and he thought we could do it with FBCG or so all those were FBCG folks filmed in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Stetson and John Cruz helped put that together along with Jeff and a few other of our staff. And I love the simple way uh, that it communicates transformation, stories. Uh, and you're going to have a chance to consider your own uh, cardboard testimony a little later uh, this evening. I want to start by saying um, I've never been in jail I hope that comes as no surprise, uh, other than to play basketball a couple times with inmates years ago. But once I thought I might be going to jail, I want to tell you that story. It was after my first year of college, my family had moved from uh, a small town about 40 miles north of New York City, where I grew up, all the way to Orlando, Florida, a thousand miles away. So I go home from school after my freshman year, and I convinced my parents to let me drive their car from Orlando to New York just above New York City, so I could visit my old hometown, see my old friends since we moved away. And I convinced them to let me take my, let me take my two younger brothers. Uh, my brother uh, Joe uh, was 16, just starting to drive. Our youngest brother was about seven. Uh, a, a road trip for the brothers all the way to New York City, and they let us go. <laughs> I now consider um, that decision my parents made to be completely insane now that I'm a parent myself. Well, we packed up, headed out, planning to drive straight through the night, to New York, somewhere around 2 in the morning. As I recall, we're going through Georgia. Uh, I was driving, my two brothers were sleeping in the back seat, and I saw the flashing lights in my rearview mirror. I had never gotten a ticket before, but I knew enough to pull over, so I pull over on the highway. The officer gets to my window, he looks in, takes one look at the boys in the back seat and at me, and says, son, just follow me to the station. I had no idea how unusual that was, so I just did what I was told. He had the flashing lights going, he drove off the highway, down a country road, for miles, and finally came to this uh, little local sheriff's office in a small town in Georgia. Took us inside. My brothers are awake by this time. Their eyes about that big. Walked in, and it looked exactly like the jail in Mayberry. Exactly. Remember that? You got Andy and Barney and Otis. You know, Otis was always in one of the cells. Sheriff was like this boss hog looking guy. Had a big old star. I'm, I'm not kidding. A big old star badge on his chest. I could see the jail cell with the bars and everything. And the sheriff sat me down at his big old desk. He starts asking me questions. What's your name, son? I told him, you're a long way from home, boy. Where are you going, with, uh, where are you going this time of night? Your daddy know you, your daddy know you got his car? And then it dawned on me with his questions that he thought we might be runaways. He thought maybe we'd stolen our parents' car. I could see the jail cell from where I was sitting, and just when I thought that's where we were going to end up, even my little brother, he says to me, why don't we call your daddy and see if he can straighten everything out. And that wasn't the most fun phone call I ever made, two in the morning to my dad saying I'm in the sheriff's office in Georgia. Um, but he did not throw us in jail and we continued on our trip. I found out later that my father paid my speeding ticket with his credit card over the phone, which is why Boss Hogg let us go. We're starting a new series here today called Tales of Transformation, Reaching Real People. And we're going to start with a story that begins in prison. Let me give you a little background so to catch you up to speed. We're working our way through the great book of Acts, the story of the early church. We're about 20 years into the story now. It's about 50 A.D., so 20 years or so after the resurrection of Jesus. Paul and his friend Silas are, continue, are continuing on what's called the second great missionary journey. By this time, they've been joined likely by Timothy, a younger man, and probably Luke, who later wrote the book of Acts and the gospel according to Luke as well. Uh, they've been revisiting churches in the area called Turkey, that we call Turkey, from the first journey. And then Paul is led by the Holy Spirit to leave Turkey and to head westward toward Greece. We see this part of the story back in Acts chapter 16. Let me read a couple of verses for you. Acts 16, verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul during the night. A Macedonian man, I'll tell you more about where Macedonia was in just a minute, was standing there urging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul saw the vision, we attempted immediately to go over to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We put out the sea from Troas and sailed a straight course to Samothrace, uh, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of, that, of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We stayed in this city for some days. Now we're told that Philippi, this city, was in a region called Macedonia that we would today call northern Greece. Take a look at the map. 
You can see the, uh, all the way to the right of the screen, the east is Israel, Jerusalem, where uh, everything started. Then you can see to the north there, the upper region is Turkey. And then far to the west, uh, the, the top left portion of the map, you see Greece. And that red line is, is the jagged line of Paul's second missionary journey, how he got there. And it's a very long trip. So Paul and Silas are now technically all the way into Europe. And this marks the birth of the church in Philippi. Now, I think there's evidence in the New Testament that this particular church became kind of a beacon church in the whole region. Maybe even the Apostle Paul's favorite group of believers, known for their maturity, known for their great generosity. It's the church to whom Paul later wrote the wonderful letter that we call the book of Philippians in the New Testament. Now, the church in Philippi begins with a couple of individual tales of transformation. Earlier in chapter 16, we see the story of the conversion of a woman named Lydia. Sterling's going to share this uh, with you next week, or, um, uh, next week I, th- I believe. Then we see the miraculous healing of a young slave girl uh, who was possessed by a demon. Uh, the girl's being used as a kind of fortune teller by some men who claim to be religious, but are really kind of like carny uh, workers. They're abusing this girl because she has these unusual gifts, and they're making money off her troubled soul. Paul sees what's happening, doesn't like it. He prays for her in the name of Jesus and casts out the demon, and she instantly is delivered and made well. Her handlers are angry because now they've lost their meal ticket. So they drag Paul and Silas uh, before the magistrates and accuse them of disrupting the city. No due process, no chance to explain or defend themselves, which was actually a violation of Roman law because Paul and Silas were both technically Roman citizens, even though they were Jewish. Uh, That becomes significant a little bit later in the story. They're then beaten uh, by a mob with rods, thrown into a local dungeon. Their legs are put in stocks, which in the ancient world, stocks were designed not just to keep you from running somewhere, but actually were a torture device to put you in uncomfortable positions. Not a good situation, and that brings us to the story we read today. Acts 16, beginning in verse 25. Let me read it for you, and then we'll try to uh, see what God has for us. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Now the first thing I want to point out in this beautiful story is a person. The jailer. Point one today is simply the jailer. Let me ask you a question. When you were 10 years old, however long back you have to think, when you were 10 years old, what did you want to be when you grew up? Just shout it out loud. What did you want to be? Teacher, actress, astronaut, president. Those are actually what I wrote down. I wrote down teacher, astronaut, president, and nobody said pastor. I didn't, I didn't even want to be a pastor. I wanted to be second baseman for the New York Yankees. How many said police officer? Law enforcement, okay? Plenty of young people grow up aspiring to serve and protect through law enforcement, to be police officers or detectives or crime investigators. But my guess is very few would have said prison warden. Anybody say prison warden here? Prison guard? Okay. I looked up prison guard career description. On the internet, here's what I found. Prison guards are responsible for enforcing rules, preventing assaults and escapes, and maintaining general order. A guard is also required to respond to emergency situations such as riots, fires, and confrontations. A guard at maximum security prisons um, is subjected to a violent subculture on a daily basis. Uh, 
no thanks, right? I, I'm not signing up uh, unless I'm forced to. And that's talking about prisons in our world, in our culture, not a Roman prison 2,000 years ago. This ancient jailer, notice, is anonymous. Luke does not ever give us his name, which is kind of odd given in the book of Acts. We have dozens and dozens of names in the book of Acts, but we don't know this guy's name. He's probably an ex-Roman soldier himself. There were lots of um, uh, ex-Roman soldiers uh, living in the region of Philippi at this time. He was either assigned this job by a commander somewhere, or he was forced to take it due to lack of other opportunities. He's exposed to all manner of violence, depravity, brutality on a daily basis. He's likely participated in his share of brutality as well. It took a tough guy to do this job. He's almost certainly a pagan Gentile who's lived his whole life assuming the gods, small g, were distant and unconcerned with his life. The Roman historian Hesiod estimates that there were some 30,000 local and ancestral deities in that particular culture at that time. So this man would have likely thought about the gods, again, small g, in mostly superstitious terms, unrelated to his life. Now this man stands in some contrast to the story of the first convert in Philippi, which is a woman named Lydia. Again, Sterling's going to tell her story next week. She was a successful merchant, an affluent woman, likely an educated person, but not so this man. The jailer is a hardened, cynical, likely angry man in a dead-end job. He would fall into the category that I would call least likely to ever hear or respond to the gospel. Least likely. This is a guy who would never, ever on his own go to church. This is a guy who would never tune into Moody Radio, if they had that in that, those days, or K-Love. Not interested. Would never visit fbcg.com to listen to one of Jeff or my sermons. Not interested. A tough, hardened character. But the story tells us he does end up hearing the gospel. He just doesn't hear it in church. He hears and sees the gospel right where he is. A dead-end job, prison guard in the ancient world. That's the jailer. The next thing we see in the story are two people, and I'm calling them the missionaries. We go from the jailer to the missionaries. Most of you, I would guess, recognize the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Recognize the name? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and theologian who became involved in an underground movement to overthrow Adolf Hitler and the evils of the Third Reich during World War II. Even though he was a pacifist, he eventually became convinced that Hitler was so evil that he participated in a plot to assassinate the Fuhrer. He was discovered and arrested in 1943. He was eventually transferred to the much-feared prison called Buchenwald. But many of his writings, written in prison, he was a young man in his late 30s, uh, survived prison because the Nazi guards actually smuggled out Bonhoeffer's writings. And they did so because they'd come to respect and love him as their pastor. Even in prison, Bonhoeffer inspired others through his selfless service. He cared for others, the sick, even his guards. He ministered to the Nazi guards. So when it became evident that the Nazi regime was never going to release Bonhoeffer, and they didn't, the guards made sure his writings and poems and prayers made it out, and they're in books still today. In one of those writings, Bonhoeffer wrote, Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering of Christ. And it's therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. In fact, it is a joy and a privilege and a token of his grace, he wrote, from prison. On April 9, 1945, by order of Heinrich Himmler himself, Bonhoeffer was executed by hanging at the concentration camp in Flossenburg just a few days before it was liberated by the Allies. Luke tells us that Paul and Silas have been beaten with rods. Scholars say that some men died from that kind of beating. They didn't. Then they're thrown in jail. Their legs are put in stocks, likely in an uncomfortable position. Then in verse 25, we read a shocking, surprising sentence. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Luke begins the story by reporting that it's midnight, and their prisoners uh, are in this place of torture and darkness and death. And they're listening in the darkness to two strangers from another place singing and praying to their God. I call this the miracle before the miracle. 
Because a Roman dungeon was not a place where anyone expected to hear singing and praying. And I have a story like that I want to tell you tonight. Some years ago, when I was youth pastor, uh, I would lead short-term trips with students down to the Dominican Republic. We went 8, 10, 12 years uh, helping build different kinds of orphanage buildings and so forth in those small communities. On one of those trips, we were working in a mountain village, um, uh, building a care center for the impoverished kids of that region. And conditions were quite primitive uh, from what we were used to in North American standard uh, culture. We slept in sleeping bags on bare concrete floors. Daytime temperatures pushed 100 degrees even at night. It was just sweltering. And to take baths every day, we either dumped buckets of cold water on our heads, there were no showers or anything, or we walked about a mile to a local river where the women washed their clothes and we'd bathe there and walk back. By the time you got back, you're all sweaty again, so we rarely did that. That's what we did to bathe. So one morning, I, I woke up early, like about 5 in the morning, primarily because I just couldn't sleep anymore. The combination of the concrete floor, the heat, and the sounds. I've always said in the third world or developing world, you can, if you stop, you can always hear three things. You can hear uh, a rooster crowing, you can hear a dog barking, or a child crying. If you stop, you can usually hear all three. And so it's five in the morning, and there's dozens of roosters crowing. They start like three in the morning. They're crowing, they're crowing. I can't sleep anymore. The, the, and so I, I get up, and I try to uh, I climb up onto the second floor of the building where I hope it'll be a little cooler and wait for my morning cup of coffee. And, and truth be told, feeling a little sorry for myself. Can't sleep. I'm tired. When's the trip going to end? That kind of thing. And I became aware as I was just sitting up there of all hearing all the sounds that one of the sounds that I wasn't paying attention to was a woman's voice. A woman was singing early in the morning in the darkness. I looked around at all the little tiny cinder block and corrugated tin buildings that were served as homes around this, the orphanage we were building. I was trying to find out who was singing, who was, where is she singing? And then I, then I saw her. There was a young woman uh, standing out behind her home, sweeping the dirt that served as the backyard to her tiny little home. I recognized who it was because I'd seen her the day before carrying a couple of small children, a couple following her. She had three or four little children. I saw her doing a laundry down in the river, and she was out at 5.30 in the morning singing, and then I slowly started to realize, I, I recognized the tune that she was singing. I listened more closely, and I heard these Spanish words. Mi corazón entona la canción. Cuán grande es él, cuán grande es él. My Spanish wasn't great, but I knew what those words meant. We sang it here this evening. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. She was singing a hymn of praise. She was singing how great thou art at 5.30 in the morning as she swept the dirt behind her corrugated tin house in the Dominican Republic. And I was sitting up there getting ready to go home, feeling sorry for myself because of how hard my life was. I just sat and listened. Just listened. Moved deep in my soul by such faith, such gratitude, such joy. I kept thinking, how can someone who has so little have so much gratitude? That's what we see in the story. Paul and Silas are singing and praying in prison in the middle of the night. Notice, the jailer doesn't hear the gospel in church. He doesn't hear it intentionally at all. He hears it in prison from two men who should be bitter and angry but are praying and singing instead. The gospel reaches him right where he is. Then we come to a second miracle, verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now we all know earthquakes bring destruction. When earthquakes hit, things fall down. Buildings crumble, walls collapse, people are buried alive in rubble, especially in the ancient world, the way things were built. But not this earthquake. This earthquake brings not destruction, but freedom. All the bonds fall off. The stocks let them go. The doors swing open. Great news for the prisoners, bad news for the jailer. Verse 27, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now, what's going on here? It wasn't his fault. Why kill himself? Well, this requires a little understanding of ancient Roman law. The law at the time would have required him, the jailer, to fill the sentences of those who escaped on his watch. Whether it was one or ten or twenty, 
he had to fill their sentences. So suicide to him seemed a better option than turning himself over to his authorities. He had become a living example of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, when he writes, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, and listen to this phrase, having no hope and without God in the world. This is that man, no hope without God in the world. He knows his life is over. He's a dead man walking, verse 28. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, for we're all here. The prisoners don't flee, partly because they were confused and afraid as well. There were very severe punishments for escaped prisoners who were caught, and many of them didn't want to risk it at that time. It was dark. It was confusing. But Paul and Silas don't leave because God has something more for them to do. They believed God had called them to Macedonia. Remember, Paul had a vision, a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. So they went to Macedonia. They believed God had a purpose for them there. Their mandate had not changed. Jesus had said, you will be my witnesses. That call, that purpose, that mandate remained firm even though they were in prison. This is part of what Paul means when later he wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good For those who are called according to his purpose. When you're called according to his purpose, the Lord makes things work together for good. It's what he meant when he wrote Philippians 4.13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. You know, athletes put that on their foreheads and, and stuff all the time. It wasn't about scoring touchdowns in the Super Bowl. It doesn't not mean that, but it means this. It means in whatever situation I find myself, no matter how difficult, my purpose remains clear and he gives me strength. Paul and Silas understand that their purpose has not changed, even though they've been thrown in prison. The point for us is we are missionaries, all of us, all the time, wherever we are. We're just either good missionaries or lousy missionaries, but we're always missionaries. We're always representing something or someone. You may find yourself thinking, why am I stuck in this lousy job? I got to go to work every day and work with these lousy people, this lousy boss. Why am I stuck in this lousy job? Or you may say, how come I got this crazy roommate in college? I want another roommate. Or how come I'm in this hospital room? At least part of the answer is, in every situation, so that you can fulfill the great purpose for which I created you. So that you can fulfill the great purpose that I've given you, which is to bear witness to the goodness, love, and salvation of God, wherever you are. Finally, we come to the third part of the story, the question. So we have the jailer, we have the missionaries, and we have the question. Life is full of all kinds of very important questions. Where should I go to college? What kind of career should I pursue? Who should I marry? When will the Cubs win the World Series? Important questions. Over a century ago, a Russian literary giant named Leo Tolstoy wrote a short story entitled Three Questions. In the story, a king is seeking answers to these three questions. What's the right time for every action? Who are the most necessary people? And what's the most important thing to do? Good questions. I read uh, the other day a blog where somebody said, the most important question in life is why bother? Simple, but when you think about it, pretty good question. Why bother? The story in Acts 16 revolves around a single question, a question that in one way or another, every single human being is destined someday to ask whether or not they're fully aware of it. The question is uttered by a nameless jailer who blurts out in the middle of the night. Then it says in verse 30, Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, notice the change in attitude. He would have once considered these guys to be um, uh, worthy of of disrespect and even even, uh, disgust. Now he reproaches them with great respect. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's the question. What must I do to be saved? 
Why does he ask this question at this time? Now, it seems to me that you only ask a question like that if you're convinced of some sort of peril, some sort of mortal danger. Why else should we, would you ask about being saved? The question also assumes that there is someone or something that can provide safety or salvation from that particular danger that you fear. For example, it's a question I might ask in some form if I fell overboard out in the open sea. What must I do to be saved? Somebody would yell out, swim toward the life preserver and hang on. Right? It's a question that a pilot might ask an air traffic controller when his instruments suddenly start, stop working. What must I do to be saved? The guy would say, well, listen to my instructions and do everything exactly as I tell you, and you'll get that plane on the ground. It's a question born of desperation. It's a question of life and death. He's a dead man walking, and he knows it. But I think there's something else going on here. I think he also asked this question because somewhere along the line, don't know exactly where, he too had been listening. Along with those prisoners who heard these two crazy foreigners as they sang and prayed to their God in the middle of the night. Luke says it's midnight. The prisoners are listening. They're listening because they've never heard anything like this before. They're listening because Paul and Silas are singing praises to a God they believe loves them even though they're in prison. They're listening because they're praying to a God they believe knows them and cares about them, even in this place of pain and suffering. They're listening because these two men have two things that they do not have, in fact, know nothing about. They have both faith and joy. And I think we can assume somewhere along the line the jailer was listening as well, and he wants what they have. Question. Is it possible that God allowed Paul and Silas to be accused unjustly, beaten mercilessly, thrown into prison illegally, just so this jailer could hear the gospel? Is that possible? Yeah, I think it is possible. More than that, I think it's the point of the whole story. The gospel is unstoppable. The gospel goes places and reaches people that we think are unreachable. Paul and Silas respond, verse 31, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. There's a whole sermon in this one sentence. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You don't have to do anything, notice. You don't have to offer incantations or sacrifices to pagan gods and goddesses. You don't have to try to pile up a stack of good deeds so God will be impressed. Believe. See, salvation is not found in what we do. Salvation is received as a gift based on what someone else did. Salvation is found in who we believe, not in what we do. Now, There are two doorways into understanding this story and identifying with this story. The first doorway is through Paul and Silas, the missionaries. Beaten with rods, thrown into prison, they are off mission. Things have gone all kinds of sideways. They're not doing what they expected to do. They're not in church. They're not in synagogue. They're not preaching the gospel to crowds. They have their legs in stocks. It's not going right. They could have easily thrown up their hands and, and wailed, Why, God? Why is this happening to us? Get us out of here. What are you doing? What do they do? They worship and pray right where they are. Here's the question. What's our witness like? What's your witness like? Not in here where it's easy. Out there where you live. What's it like? Second, we can identify with the jailer. Maybe this is why he isn't given a name. Maybe it's God's way of saying, it isn't just his story, it's everyone's story. It isn't just his question, it's the question we all must ask. Because we all have this deep burning question. We rarely ask it out loud, but we know it's there. And we know it's desperately important. What must I do to be saved? Maybe you've always assumed that salvation is found in something you do. You've been trying to be good. And today you realize it's not about that. 
It's about someone you believe in who did something for you. I love that video that we showed at the beginning of the sermon. Such a great way to capture tales of transformation. I think, and I was thinking about this, if the Philippian jailer had been in that video, here's what, here's what his cardboard would have said. Would have said, trapped, hopeless, dead man. After he heard the gospel, after he responded in faith, he might have said, set free, hope-filled, alive again. So what's your story? We all have one. I'm going to give you a chance as we close the service to kind of think about your own story. Ushers are coming in. They're going to have these little cards that look like this, like mini little cardboard things. They're going to put them at each end of the aisle, just pass them down the row until you each have one. Take a pen anywhere near you. And in a moment, I'm going to pray, close the service, and then the band's going to come up, and they're going to play through another great traditional hymn. Um, go ahead, you can pass them out. Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And as they play, just take your pen and think of your own life. And on side A, you write what it was before you knew who Jesus was for you. Two, three words, write a description, and then flip it over, and what's your side B? What's the transformation that's taken place? How would you put it into just a few words? You know, if you're, and if you aren't sure if you have a story, if you can't do it in just a few minutes, take it home with you. Do it then. It doesn't really matter when you do it. But if you aren't really sure you have a side B, maybe that story can start today. In 1 Corinthians 5, 17, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Bow in prayer with me, and then you can write on your cards. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the transforming power of the gospel that comes to us where we are, as we are, and transforms us. From the words of confusion or despair or failure on side A of our lives to the truth and hope and promise of side B. And Lord, if someone here today is uncertain of their side B, help them start to rewrite their story today by your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.